So the needs and priorities of this generation is quite distinct. Uh, a Deloitte report says that almost 53% of Gen Zs who have entered the workforce have changed their jobs in the last couple of years. So is there a, you know, is, is, is there a, is our organizations finding it difficult to meet their aspirations? And what are you as an organization doing to kind of really retain this talent and also, of course, first of all, attract them? If you go to the root cause of why they leave, it's more changing roles, perhaps, and less changing organizations. And as long as the organization is able to offer them roles which are very different every, let's say, three, four, maybe even two years, uh, I think uh, the organization would be in a good space. So for us, because we are a multi-category company, into many segments in some of the categories, many geographies, and a lot of new functions, new age functions which have come in, the sheer breadth of offering uh, is, is very wide. And I think therefore every company needs to develop a portfolio of roles uh, for the Gen Z to move every two or three years. And if they do that, I think uh, this whole leaving will not necessarily happen. Of course, the culture is a separate point, but I'm saying the most important reason why they leave is because they want to do a new thing. A new thing can be within the company. Um, Manish, I would like to hear from you on the same as to what are you doing to attract this segment in Amazon? Yeah, I think um, I agree with Venkat. One of the things with um, the Gen Z employees, and I have a kid at that age, so I can, I'm quite close to, um, there is a very, very distinct need of upskilling and learning. Yeah. And therefore at Amazon, I mean, we are a little lucky that uh, it's not a very old company, it's 28 years old worldwide, but um, employees have the responsibility of managing their careers. So we have an open job posting where people can apply across locales or across businesses, cloud computing, Kindle, consumer business, entertainment, um, and um, at this point of time, I mean, I would have people who worked in my team over the last eight years in almost every big city and across businesses. The second is we have a, a concept that any employee can write a one pager. It's called a press release. Just, just think of what we would want a magazine like yours to talk about any new business and they can submit it. So we've had instances where I have someone in my team who wrote that for the pharmacy business. He now gets to run the pharmacy business. So I think upskilling and the fact that they want to manage their career is very important. I think the second thing is, this is a generation which has not seen a world without the internet. So they have so much of information and they look forward to organizations which are flat, egalitarian, where everyone is equal. Um, your tenure or your designation does not decide uh, how much you can contribute. So at Amazon, um, all of us, all 13 lakh plus employees, we have similar offices, similar perks, travel, stay, exactly the same way. So we've never ever differentiated employees in terms of their seniority on how you are treated within the company. It's, it's, it's very difficult, by the way, because I still remember my first day at Amazon, the conference room was full, and I came from a company, uh, an awesome company, but if you were senior, people would get up and offer you their seat. No one does that in, in new gen companies. And I had to sit on the floor along with a lot of kids. And at my age, cross-legged wasn't very comfortable. So I think that's the second important thing. You have to, skilling and then creating an environment in the company where every employee is equal, yeah? The third one is they want to work for companies which they feel proud about and being able to associate with. It goes far beyond compensation. So when my own employees actually six years back said, why do we use so much plastic in the packaging? I hadn't heard it in my previous like 15, 18 years of working. And they expect you to solve for it. If you don't, they believe that their values and the company values are not matching. So I think combination of skilling, the culture in a company, and does the company match the values of its Gen Z employees? When the three come together, I think it works well. Thank you. 
Uh, coming to you, Shruti, you just told me before we came up on the stage that you had a had an interesting conversation with a potential Gen Z employee. Uh, so it'll be interesting to hear from you as to what kind of conversations uh, you're having in general, and of course, if you can tell us, uh, you know, about that conversation also. Sure. So um, just a couple of hours ago, I happened to interview a young person for a position in our organization, and it was a really um, it was an interesting conversation. I think, you know, of course the interview went on as normal, you know, talking about experience, yada, yada. But the thing that really clicked, um, and the thing that I, I think, you know, because I have to, you know, I always think that interviews are, it is me, of course, interviewing this person for a position and a role within a large organization. It's also them choosing us, right? The, I, if you, good candidates have usually a selection of organizations to which that they could potentially go to. So I also look at it at sort of, I need to court them as well, right? So any interview, I'm sort of putting myself out there also to connect. And I think the thing that really connected with this person, and I've seen this time and time again, is really um, inspiration, right? If you're able to inspire a person, and particularly with purpose, you have come, you've gone deeper than just talking about a role, a job, or even a career. You've gotten to you've gotten to value system, and you've kind of you know what you were just touching about, right? You you're kind of then really sinking deep into a person's being and showing them, hey, listen, this is maybe where you belong, right? And as an employer, it also gives me a sense of where their value system lies, and for me, that's extremely important as an or you know, given that our organization holds value so strongly. So it's a very, um, it was a very interesting moment, right? To see that, okay, like if you are able to connect on that, on that idea, right? On, be, on pur being purposeful, then there is this way that, you know, you're able to kind of find some, something in common. I also think that, you know, the, it was uh, this particular instance, uh, you know, I, I felt that this person was really looking for inspiration in a sense in the leader that they were talking to. Um, and what I mean by that is I do think that this generation has been through a lot, right? I mean, you, again, you touched upon it. They've been through recession. They saw COVID. They've gone through so many ups and downs in the last couple of years that it, it really is important for them to now look at leaders as people of inspiration and people who will openly communicate and be transparent with them and be real with them, quite honestly. I think that is something that they're looking for, like genuinely, right? It's not, it's not the same as like a parental figure. It's not the same as like a dictatorial figure. It's somebody who will really, you know, it inspires them and, you know, seems as a person that will really help them grow and come into their own as they are going into sort of those more, you know, middle years of their career. What kind of conversations are you have? So, um, you know, when you look at, when you define Gen Z in the right uh, method, that means they're about 25, 26 years. So if you really look at it, most people join the organization at 23. So it's just been about three, four years of what we call Gen Zs who've come into being. And I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, I do agree with the comments being made in terms of how to manage. I think the biggest point is for us to learn what exactly uh, is this uh, generation um, uh, expecting? Uh, and, and, and that learning, um, a lot of, I think for me, the most important is how you can learn for yourself. Because, you know, at your position, if you learn something and you want to make a change, then, you know, the responsibility is with you. Uh, uh, I, I have a conversation with about eight, ten people on a regular basis, just like a small coffee, and you just chat and get to know each other. Uh, what is very interesting when you have this conversation is that a lot of people come and talk about not what the job that they're doing, but you know who they are, what do they like, what their passions are. Uh, second uh, was in terms of this discussion around mental health. Right? And uh, yeah, it was an eye-opener that people are so comfortable to talk about it. And the question that was raised was, what is the company, what is the organization doing about mental health? You do so many things for physical health and medical facilities and all that is there, but how much is being uh, invested around mental health? And I think that was uh, a conversation that we immediately we said, no, okay, fine, uh, we, we need to do better, right? Uh, so that is uh, one example that you, know, you learned in terms of how the, uh, uh, the generation is evolving. 
the uh, other area, of course, comes in in terms of uh, do I have a chance to, you know, um, work on my passions, right? How do you make the work more engaging? Uh, and, and, and therefore, in terms of how do you, uh, in a large organization, you know, in, in our previous conversation, you were calling us legacy organization. Uh, but I must tell you, uh, uh, I have 32% of my population is below 30 years of age, right? So it's no longer as legacy as it would be. But I think in terms of policy changes, these conversations make a lot of difference. And, and, and therefore, you're able to drive change. You know, we talked about diversity. You talk about the language. And I think one big area that uh, we have to learn is the language that you speak. You never realize that this is maybe offensive. Right, and maybe it was acceptable uh, two generations, you know, uh, 15 years back. But I think we as senior people need to evolve on that and actually continually learn. So I think that would be my comments. Venkat, uh, you have spent 34 years with uh, Titan. So uh, when you speak to your, uh, uh, your Gen Z uh, colleagues, uh, do they often ask you how you could stay in an organization for such a long time? Uh, and uh, if they ask you what, what really is your response to them? Uh, in fact, I just had lunch with some 10 of them today, coincidentally. And one of them asked me. And, uh, and that person wasn't even, you know, born when I joined the company. So I said, uh, family. Uh, Titan is like family. And, uh, and this is a notion that is very strong in Titan. Uh, it uh, sometimes feels a little maybe outdated notion in 2023, but you'd be surprised how many Gen Zs after six months in the company say, I feel like I'm part of a family. And I think therefore the deeper aspects of human connections are everlasting and timeless, whatever else happens. And if an organization is able to evolve with the times, but still keep those connections, uh, I think that's, uh, and I was in advertising before I joined Titan, and Titan was a young person, young people's company way back in 1990. I was a little nervous when I came in, because advertising is a very cool industry, and I was coming into a Tata Group company, and I was wondering if it would be a little, you know, bureaucratic and stuff like that, but it was a very, very chilled out, even better than the advertising agency I left, uh, and I'm talking about 1990, and those seeds were sown way back, and we have, because we, so many of us have stayed back, we managed to retain that young people thing from that time. So our vocabulary has been, you know, young people's all the time. So we didn't have to really reinvent our language, idiom, nothing. We've just evolved as opposed to having to pivot. So Shruti, coming to you again, this is a generation which is laying a lot of emphasis on purpose and ethics. Uh, and there's a Deloitte report which says that purpose and ethics to many of them is actually more valuable. They're okay with if the compensation uh, is kind of a little lower, provided their, uh, uh, you know, their purpose meet, matches with the organization's objectives. So how different is your, uh, you know, employer branding when you go to, uh, uh, you know, campuses to recruit, um, you know, what do you say? How do you? So we actually just launched a program that's pretty revolutionary within the hospitality industry, which is a fairly traditional industry, if you think about it. Uh, the program is called Responsible Hoteliers of Tomorrow. So essentially what it is is that we take college students in, we have them doing an internship with us. The, a lot of the internship is, of course, the typical skilling, right? Learning whatever you need to know when, you need, when you're working in a hotel. But um, a, a big chunk of what we're teaching them is really about sustainable practices. And that has to do with, um, you know, how do you involve the community in the work that you're doing in the hotel? How do you look at energy efficiency? How do you look at waste management? How do you look at, um, you know, several, anything really to do with uh, sustainability? And that's pretty revolutionary. And I think, you know, I, when we launched this program, it was kind of a dream program for me. When we launched it, I was, I have to say, I was a little skeptical. I was a little concerned. I, I didn't know how many applications we were going to get. I was, you know, I wasn't quite sure. And I thought, okay, we're going to get, you know, maybe a dozen people and we'll, you know, that's all we're going to get. We ended up getting quite a few applications. It was interesting, right? I think that young people really, 
they, they, you know, were very interested. And they were interested in this perspective. They wanted to understand, like, you know, what is the industry going to look like in the future? You know, how is my industry, the one where I'm choosing to end up in, applying these values that I believe in, in regards to being responsible and being sustainable. And so I think the communication that we put out there has to really revolve, it, and it does, it often revolves around this idea, like what is, why do we exist, rather than this is what we do, right? So I th the purpose is always at the forefront. We really, you know, we talk about being a purpose-driven or organization. That's also how we're trying to communicate in terms of letting people know like, hey, listen, this is really, this is why we are here. And this is, if you're part of this, if you feel that sense of belonging and you feel that sense of purpose, you, you know, you feel a common sense of purpose with us, then here's a place where we think you will belong and you would have a fulfilling journey, right? And this is a place where you can really not just do a job, but you can really apply yourself and, um, and live your values while building your career. Uh, Hemant, how different is your employer branding today from what it was, say, even two, two, two or three years ago? So I think um, um, I would take up from what Shruti was mentioning about uh, the whole aspects of sustainability. I think ITC's uh, story on sustainability goes back two decades. We've been water positive for 21 years, carbon positive for 18 years, and zero solid waste for 16 years. Uh, but what I've, what we've, and we've been doing it even before this Gen Z was probably born because that's what the organization believed in. Uh, but now we find the resonance is so much higher. But I think uh, uh, what we need to work on more is in terms of how do you make it, you know, more approachable. It's not just something somewhere else does. You know, it is how can I be part of it? And that's what, that's a question that come up, you know. If I, company, the organization is doing, will I get a chance to participate in that? And therefore, that's what, you know, is one aspect. So therefore, you know, uh, earlier your presentation would have been in terms of what your uh, gross revenues would be. Now the presentation is what is your sustainability part of it, right? That's where your stories are going. Uh, the second big area is, of course, uh, from a diversity perspective in terms of what the organization is doing, how are you driving, how are you looking at the, from a, not only the policy perspective, and I mentioned about language. So these are the two aspects that have come up right up front. The third, which will always remain important is, uh, you know, am I going to get, uh, uh, is it going to be very bureauc bureaucratic or will I get a chance to do what I want to do, right? And I think, uh, you know, you started with a Deloitte report of 53% uh, having two jobs. Uh, I think we belong to the 47%, right? We, we have people because we take straight from the campus. And the onus is in terms of, of course, there will be few who will leave. Uh, the few who have left and who have become entrepreneurs here and who are part of this 40 under 40 and we are really proud of that, right? And that's the uh, environment that we are looking at in terms of giving people, in terms of where you can come, uh, you can do many things. Uh, if you want to continue, you continue uh, you, or you carry the legacy of ITC wherever you are. Thank you. Um, coming to you, Manish, um, again, this is a generation which has entered the workforce. Most of them have entered during covid a lot of uncertainty, they have seen job losses happening, their parents have lost their jobs. So, I mean, there's a rep again, quoting the uh, Deloitte report, they, they, they prefer stability. Uh, it's unlike the millennials who used to idealize uh, uh, school dropouts. This generation, I'm told, they, <laughs> they, um, they prefer some kind of stability. So, what are you doing? Uh, you know, how are you capitalizing on this to kind of, uh, what kind of an environment have you created for them so that they actually, uh, you know, kind of continue uh, with you for the long term? Yeah, I, I don't know about stability. I was smiling because I've been trying to tell my kid to take a job and he keeps on saying, every second day he says, I'll do my doctoral, then he says, I'm going to do my master's. So I'm not sure, but I think what is important is this generation, because of the kind of information they have, they have a very clear point of view and they want to manage their career. Yeah? So that generation is gone where HR would tell you, you know, what is the next step? They, they want to say, this is what I want to learn and this is how I want to run my career. So we have a concept and like I said, we are probably blessed that we have businesses which are so diverse and most of them are at cutting edge of what's happening, whether it's um, say Prime Video on OTT or it's we're just launching the Kuiper low orbit satellite system in India or AWS. 
and what we offer our employees is what we call the jungle gym um saying careers are no longer about promotions in the traditional sense it's about um work on pharmacy for a year go off to cloud computing learn it for a year go and make the next mirzapur or a family man if you have the creative juices so our um, employer proposition is we would be at the leading edge of technology and we will give you so many diverse experiences which you would want so today i mean kids are writing in saying you know tell us a little more about large language models yeah and we can provide that so i think that's where our focus is provide a conducive environment but priority number 1 is give them enough chances to learn and skill themselves that is probably the driving force on where they would want to continue a career um venkat the next question actually comes from my gen z colleague urvashi um so she said that uh, she says that on one hand while she wants stability on the other hand uh, you know she, there's also entrepreneurial fire in her belly so uh, so as an organization um, are you taking any initiatives to uh, you know kind of uh, encourage your uh, um, gen z colleagues to kind of be more enterprising or are you encouraging entrepreneurship we've always believed in uh, cross functional teams working to solve you know wicked challenges that's been a institutionalized process for a long time decades and therefore everyone gets a chance to do very interesting things and we have multiple programs which encourage innovation as well and just two weeks back you know we have a program called interweave which are teams which participate participate in creating uh, very innovative solutions for vexing problems kind of thing and the team which coincidentally won it was from the internal audit team and all four of them young women all gen z and uh, using ai and analytics to actually predict problems that may occur uh, in various processes and helping the businesses to you know identify before actually it happens so therefore this cross functional teams through which sometimes the for example we had a program called igniter and that igniter program was an entrepreneurship program and our sari business which we launched a few years back was born out of teams which participated in that so therefore entrepreneurship is a very active alive thing in in our company thank you uh, shruti you're a new age company so uh, do what are you doing to encourage your colleagues to actually you know become entrepreneurial do you do anything differently um yeah so i think what we do is we create a lot of um sounding boards i mean in the sense uh, we try to really keep communication very open from the top to the bottom i think it's something that you know we're we're not at the size of these organizations obviously we've just crossed about 1000 employees recently and our employees are fairly dispersed across the country um you know and um, many of my employees the majority of them are very young people Uh, so we have utilized technology, of course. We've used, utilized a lot of other methods as well to figure out how can we ensure that people feel heard and that we're able to listen um, at all levels. Because I do think that that, of course, increases the ability for collaboration and and entrepreneurship in general. But it also, um, I think, like you know, going back, it it gives you a sense of belonging, right? And if you're heard and one of your ideas is act actually, you know, we're able to implement it at a larger level, it really does give um, an opportunity for us to be able to recognize that person um, for the contributions that they've given to the organization, which I, I also think is something which is far more important today than it ever has been in the past. So, you know, these channels of communication, I think, are the primary way in which we've encouraged, um, you know. growth and and um you know opportunity building within the organization um yeah apart from that i would just say that it's you know we're we're highly transparent i mean as an organization again we try to be um extremely communicative about what is happening uh, across also because we're scaling quite quickly it is important that the culture of the organization stays intact within the community of people that we have today and so as we're scaling we try to really keep you know we do, we're trying to keep in touch as much as possible with everyone making sure that they know what's happening what's going on what to look forward to 
so that we can all sort of grow together and we can stay, stay together as we welcome new people into, into our folds. So um, the next question I would like to hear from all of you, so this is coming to consumers. Maybe we can start with you itself. Uh, how do you innovate? Uh, you know, for the Gen Z consumers, is there anything that you're doing differently? What really is the ask of the travelers today? How different is the ask? Yeah, so the ask has been, I think, evolving, right? I mean, every year it seems to evolve, and now there's more and more studies saying that travelers want to choose more sustainable options, for instance, when, when they're traveling and they want, they want to know which, those, you know which are those sustainable options. So I think that's one thing that we've seen very recently in the last like, couple of years with COVID and things like that. But in general, I would say the travelers, what we're seeing are more demanding of experiences at every level, right? Not just in the luxury space, but as you know, also in the business segment and the mid segment, people are more interested in understanding a place in terms of you know what are the experiences which can be offered there. What is it that I can learn new in this place? You know, how can this? How does this travel enrich me as a person? I think that has become something which is very very important. And I think particularly for Gen Z, you know, they're not they don't necessarily have the biggest wallets. So they may be staying in not the most luxurious places, but they're looking for something that is going to really um, for something that they're going to connect with, you know? And so the experiences that we are creating within the organization are really to go back to that, you know, to the essence of like, you know, not necessarily providing the most fancy, you know, nothing like that, really about what, how can we show you uh, a place in a, in a respectful way? How can we introduce you to the culture of a destination? How can we introduce you to the people of a destination in a respectful way? Um, and allow you to embrace that, take that back with you as a memory um, that is something that you will keep with you. Uh, Manish, how different is your innovation pipeline today from what it was a couple of years ago? Um, I, th I think it's, um, I was just telling this to him and we have a Diwali sale starting tonight. If you go on the social media and sort of uh, crawl around, um, there's a generation, they make cheat sheets. Yeah? So they can tell you which marketplace, you know, there are lots of e-commerce companies. There is so much of information and then they share it openly. Yeah? So if you just take that behavior and, and sharp at 12 o'clock, I mean, there will be literally millions of customers who will log in. Yeah? And that is the kind of information transparency which is there. Um, if I just get to what we need to do, I'm saying over the last few years, Starting from product search, um, this generation is searching for products everywhere. It's no longer restricted to, you know, going to the search bar and typing. Um, and irrespective of, you know, whichever tier you refer to in terms of town class, people are using voice. Uh, the Gen Z is sitting here, if someone likes your dress, they take the image and they just upload it. So the, the way people are searching for products has completely changed. Yeah? And it's no longer restricted to the old traditional, and I'm talking about e-commerce, not even offline. Um, so it's very important. I mean, today you can use voice search, visual search. Um, second, the role of peer-to-peer -peer influence has become very, very large. Um, during the next X amount of days, 30 days when the sale is on, there will be thousands of influencers who will be going live on Amazon and then they talk about products. And this is not advertising because they keep the bar very high and which is why they have that loyalty. So they want to hear what these people talk about. Then they exchange notes between themselves among their peer group and then decide what to do. Um, so if, if your marketplace has reviews and ratings which do not connect with them, you lose them. Yeah. The third part, which is equally important for all of us as brand builders and retailers is uh, the post-purchase um, feedback. Again, the entire peer-to-peer -peer thing has become far more important than what was traditionally um, go to the idiot box, do the advertising. Um, all the, and I'm sure that I, I could see a lot of D2C brands in the 40 under 40. You speak to some of them and they understand the importance of um, changing their business model to focus heavily on peer-to-peer -peer 
and product feedback among that generation. So those are things which have changed quite sharply over the last three, four years. Um, Hemant, uh, when I put together the ITC story a while ago, um, you know, uh, I heard that you know I was told that you have a, a, a robust listening uh, tool. Um, so you know, what kind of uh, you know, insights do you get from there, and uh, uh, how do you innovate? How has that been translated into your innovation process? So. Um you are talking to this digital native uh, generation and therefore all the time they are, you know, uh, and, and therefore to that extent that's what we started our social listening uh, that we started a few years back. Uh, uh, but I think uh, I agree with what Manish was saying about search, but I think now the search has also moved to Insta. And therefore now how do you track in terms of what are they looking at Insta and therefore what are the new trends happening? Uh, you know, you are constantly chasing in terms of trying to understand where this consumer is going. So uh, you are not, we are not a tech company, but we have become half a tech company, right? Because that's where the consumer is and therefore, therefore you need to be. So I think marketing uh, to a large extent is therefore uh, changing in terms of uh, 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 they are, uh, advertising is something, you know, they may not be sure of. So you need to use influencers, whether it's micro, nano. Um, there are some as per uh, share chat, which is a very large, uh, Facebook, Indian Facebook, so to say, they are 56 million influencers. So everybody wants to become an influencer. So how are your brands going to come and be uh, part of that? Uh, in terms of uh, product development, product innovation, yes, you can get the insight, but I think the good thing is you can actually test out quickly thanks to so many uh, commerce platforms that are coming. It gives you, allows you to try and test and see what is working, uh, what is not working. Um, but I think uh, in terms of trying to reach the consumer and to speak this language is a constant journey and what you knew two years back is no longer relevant. So you've come up with so many new categories now, millets, then frozen foods, uh, all your beverages. So, you know, what kind of... Uh... Yeah, so I think this is, we have to do this because we have to, you know, make the Gen Z keep excited. So we have to launch new categories so that they can feel empowered and do something. Anyway, that was uh, just uh, in jest. But yeah, uh, I think uh, these are categories are coming in based upon the conversation that is taking place. And I think the International Year of Millets, which I, uh, actually Government of India has been promoting in a very big way. Uh, we have participated because in ITC, uh, you know, both from our agri perspective, we are working with farmers from, uh, you know, from making sure that you can, there'll be enough millets available. Uh, we are uh, creating demand. We are also doing work in our hotels. And of course, we've launched millets in every part, part of uh, our portfolio, whether it is noodles, uh, whether it is in terms of uh, biscuits, uh, whether it is in terms of millet flour itself. Uh, we're finding, uh, finding uh, interesting traction uh, out of that because it is uh, a sustainable uh, solution. Uh, it is a sustainable solution from India. A and I think, uh, you know, it's something that I would recommend to everybody to go because it's, you know, low GI and good for, uh, for health and vitamins in many ways. Right? Uh, Venkat, um, uh, you know, very recently you've repositioned Mia as a brand um, which kind of uses recycled gold and that is something you already always used. You have been doing it, but you're specifically talking about it now. So how has innovation kind of, how, how different are your innovations now? And if you can also talk about the Mia example first and then uh, talk about the innovations that are coming up. You've gotten into so many new categories. Uh, so Actually, I just want to, you know, dwell a little on... Uh, this whole point of purpose, yeah. I would give it a you know, different you know, word or a phrase. <clears throat> it's about corporate responsibility. Okay, whether the company has a purpose or not, is it a responsible company? Is it responsible to all the stakeholders who are involved in that creation of value? Is it responsible towards the environment, the world? Is it responsible towards the government? That is the holistic aspect of ESG. And uh, it's, uh, you know, we are very fortunate that we belong to the Tata group and the Tata group had thought about these things more than 100 years back. And uh, we have been at it for a very long time now from the corporate responsibility point of view, the whole multiple stakeholder focus. So employees, off-roll employees, distribution partners, vendor partners, all of them should get their equitable share of the prosperity that the organization is creating. 
So whether it is a 70-year-old customer or a Gen Z customer today, both of them are connecting with this. So in a way, it's been a good thing that whatever we've been naturally doing, because we believed in it, not because it was the thing to do, it automatically plays to our strength today. And uh, you know, our office, after a long, we have one of the most beautiful campuses in the world, even if I might say so, in Electronic City. After a lot of thinking, we decided to call the campus Integrity. That's the name of our campus. And it goes to the root of the single biggest thing we believe in, which is ethics. And therefore, the connections that we are making with Gen Z are in a way effortlessly happening because the company's DNA is sitting in multiple stakeholder focus right through, and as the Tata group is. And therefore, for example, we in 2005, we started a total artisan transformation program for the jewelry industry because the jewelry industry making is like quite medieval. That's 2005 when the Gen Zs were you know, sort of just about you know, starting to walk perhaps. And now after 17, 18 years, if when people hear about what we are doing for the artisans in the industry, and it's been transformational. There is no other word I would use for it. A 70 year old as well as a 20 year old is like totally impressed with it and say, this is a company which is not only looking after its shareholders. So I think that broad sweep of stakeholder focus is I think key to, certainly all the Gen Zs connect with that, that we're doing the same thing with the weavers in our sari business. We have a program called the Weaver Shala, where we want to transform the situation of the weaver and bring dignity, income, steady income, good infrastructure and working conditions to the, to the weaver. So when they come and say, oh, this is the company which is looking at the weaver, not just at you know, its own pockets, they connect. Manish, uh, you're innovating for the Gen Zs at large, but how different is a metro co a consumer, a Gen Z metro consumer from a consumer in tier two India, uh, tier two, tier three India? Is there any distinct difference? Um, yeah, the simple answer is no. Um, a decade, 15 years back, and I used to sell soup and soap in my previous job, there was a difference because in terms of the kind of information consumers had, uh, it wasn't secular. Second, the choices you had was not, I mean, I was born up in a town called Jamshedpur. I mean, even today you might struggle to find a double door 900 liter refrigerator. But with the coming in of online commerce, you can order anything from anywhere. Um, the same, uh, let me take, talk about a fashion trend. Um, right now, um, a lot of kids get inspired by Korean uh, stars. And they wear oversized t-shirts, baggy pants, and they have these jackets. Um, we see people searching for them from small places in Jharkhand, just the way someone in South Bombay is searching for it. So I think what um, the internet has done is aspirations are there now. Absolutely the same kind of aspirations are there. And there are now ways to achieve that aspiration. Um, so sometimes this tiering and economic prosperity, we talk about it together, I think that's not the case. So a small town um, consumer in, in any place, um, he or she wants the same things which anyone in the metro wants. Uh, Hemant, uh, premiumization is supposed to be the way forward for the growth of most consumer good companies. So again, if you put that in a consumer context, again, do you see a difference between your tier two, tier three consumer vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, metro, consu metro consumer? Yeah, so um, uh, I will respond and I'll say I don't agree with Manish completely on uh, they being the same. Uh, of course, uh, there's no debate that access of technology and has made a lot of difference. So the, the, the dis difference has changed. But I think in terms of attitude, uh, there is still, uh, there is a difference. I think uh, uh, both have fire. Um, one is talking about fire in the belly. Uh, one is talking about financial independence and retire early. So I think the more evolved Gen Z's that you we, typically we have been so far talking about, um, uh, but when I talk about, uh, you know, the whole aspect about 
uh, gender or diversity. It's much more in metros. In the other places, they're more acceptable about it, but right now they haven't started talking about it. Uh, in terms of being completely independent, uh, true that what you see in metro, uh, they are all actually children of Gen X, which is what some of us are here. Because we've been liberal, they are much more liberal in their mindset. Education is... Uh, uh, but when, it, when I look at the uh, tier two, tier three, there is still, in terms of family relationship, are, are important. Uh, I, I find that uh, today you ask somebody to move, right? Location is critical, right? Sorry, I'll leave the job, I'll go somewhere else, but I'm not going to leave the town. I don't find that in tier two, tier three. They are willing to move up, and, and so therefore the aspirations are, 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 are different. Venkat, what would be your thoughts on this? It's... Uh you know, it's a little different across uh, categories. For example, in our jewelry business, we go really deep. Even a brand like Carrot Lane or a Mia, which are for the you know, Gen Z and millennials, uh, succeeds in a Bilaspur, for example. But jewelry is also a store of value category in India. And they, they all know that even though they spend 25,000 bucks, that money is there for the taking. Whereas in some of the other categories, which are more about lifestyle, it's not that deep. But I would still agree, you know, a little more with uh, Manish on this, that while the number of people, and that's to do with the economic situation in that, in Abilaspur, while the number of people is less, obviously, but uh, it's becoming more and more equal in a sense. So, coming to the last leg of a conversation, Shruti, um, I would like to hear from you. Um, most leaders talk about reverse mentorship. Uh, so, what are the two things that you have learned from your Gen Z colleagues? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, I think from my colleagues, I think one is, um, is a spirit of innovation. I think really holding on to that spirit of innovation um, is something that they have, I think, been very true about. I don't know if I'm able to communicate this properly, but you know, the I, I do feel like you know, the younger that you are, the more willing you are to take risk and make mistakes, and through that, you can innovate quite a lot. Um, and as you grow, and I've seen this in my own career, I started when I was you know, 22, 23 years old. It you know, you become a lot more conservative and less open-minded in certain ways, right? You know, you start to think about things in a more sort of narrow sort of field of vision. Um, and I think the more often I'm able to talk to my younger colleagues and keep these channels of communication open, the more I'm inspired to stay open to innovation and, uh, and take those risks along with them, you know? Um, so I would say that's the primary thing that I have learned. I think apart from that, you know, it's the energy that the Gen Z brings into any organization I think is amazing, right? I think that these are young people who have a real strong sense of self in a way. Um, it's they, I, you know, I think about the, the sort of self-awareness, the, the positivity that they have, the confidence that they have in themselves. It's very different from my generation. Um, I think they're far more you know, self-confident, and I think that that's something that is admirable. So I really look up to them in that sense, and I, um, I do believe that they, if they are able to sort of hold on to that confidence, not in a um, in a haughty way, right, and with a, hopefully a sense of humbleness, humbleness as well. But if um, if they're able to do that, and they inspire me to stay a little bit more confident in my own sort of skills and things, like that, I think that it provides quite a lot of value. Uh, Manish, what are the two things that you've learned from your? Gym? Um, for me, one part is completely technical. I use them to reverse mentor me on technology because I can't do my job otherwise. I'm a computer engineer, never coded for the first two decades. So that's a must have. And the second is how they think. Um, back to office, I used to think differently and then someone said, why do you want people to go through Bangalore traffic? Let them work from home. So it really helps me think differently from what I was trained to. So two distinct parts. What are your two cents yeah, two that you cents. would like to give to your Gen Z colleagues? Oh God, first I was thinking, in fact, while you were asking the question, what have I picked up? Uh, very quickly on that, I think uh, the whole aspect of uh, there's more to life than work. I think they take it seriously. Uh, work is just one part of them. And I think that is uh, uh, something that, you know, 
I, I've have to learn part of it. And the second is more focus on uh, equal, uh, equity and diversity. I think, uh, you know, what I thought was I was doing a thing, I think there's still some more to work. In terms of what two cents I would like to give, uh, I think uh, sometimes uh, I feel if it's a privileged generation, right? They want recognition every morning uh, and saying, you know, uh, like, you know, if you don't get a reward, you know, it's like saying, you know, I did, you, I was supposed to do 10 things, but I've done five. At least reward me for those five. But there's nobody who were paid to do 10 things. So I think a uh, little bit of that, there is a little pampering that is going on. But I guess, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we have to pamper. Uh, it's the future. Uh, but uh, that, that is one. Thank you. Finally, coming to you. What are your two cents for the Gen Z? Yeah, one is uh, learn to love what you do as opposed to just hanker after what you think you love. The second is learn to put money in its place. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you.